I now call to order the fifth general session of the 54th General Assembly of the Unitarian Universalist Association. Before I call on the uh, right relations team, I wanted to point out a significant omission the other night. During Thursday's service of the living tradition, a name was inadvertently omitted during the calling forth of our ministers retiring from full-time service. And if I could ask you to listen up, this is important for you to hear, I think. A name was inadvertently omitted during the calling forth of our ministers retiring from full-time service. Because it is so important that the years of faithful service of our retirees be recognized and honored, we would like to honor the Reverend Charles Stevens for his long and excellent service to Unitarian Universalism. Thank you for that. And I believe the Right Relations team has something to report. Let's call them forth. Please welcome Mr. Barb Grieve. Good morning. We all came here with different expectations, and we each bring our past experiences, both the joys and the pains, with us. We are still learning how to live into beloved community together, and our relationships with our faith are beautiful, but can also be complicated. We don't leave our past and those relationships at the door. Some of us have been here a few days now, and in our growing comfort, we might be tempted to make assumptions about our similarities. Yesterday, we welcomed into our midst those who are only able to be with us this weekend. They come with a new energy and having missed some of the learnings from the previous days. How we communicate with each other is important. Language has the power to harm and the power to heal. Yesterday, during our open session, when we weren't at our best, there was a dynamic tension as the gathered assembly and Jim struggled to communicate. Many were frustrated, and a few of you approached feeling disrespected by how Jim was expressing himself. While we always strive to help direct address happen, there are times when this isn't possible, and yesterday was one of those times. So one of our team members met with Jim to share the feedback we had received and to find a way forward. I asked Jim if he would briefly share how that process was for him. I'm happy to, and I, what I would like to report to you is that when you're in relationship, when you're really working the covenant, when people come to you and say, you know, I didn't feel so good about something you said or did or behaved, um, it was an easy conversation. And one I would hope we could model not only here, but in our congregations. It goes back to what I was suggesting in my report on Thursday. If we are doing active covenanting, working at being better and better in relationship, uh, I think we come out of this understanding ourselves a lot better. I think we can move uh, into our discomfort zone and learn from it. Uh, I was impressed with the process. I was pleased with the person who came and spoke with me. I think that's difficult to, to speak to the power in the uh, voluntary leadership, and it was a very comfortable and growing conversation. I commend the Right Relationship team for its approach. Thank you, Jim. And we want to say thank you to all the people who are simply stopping us to say thank you for our service. We really appreciate it knowing that you are engaging in the work of keeping the love alive in our beloved community warms our hearts and gives us hope. May we each remember to bring our best selves forward, being open to learning about the impact our words and actions have on one another. Today, may we commit to practicing all that we have learned this week, knowing that to practice is to invite the possibility of mistakes and also the possibility of changing ourselves and thus the world. Have a great day. You all rock.
Thank you uh, to the right relationships team. It really was a, an exquisite process, I have to say. We're going to reprise President Peter Morales for an important presentation, I believe. I am delighted to present this year's President's Award for Volunteer Service to Gordon Gibson. This past, this past year, we've witnessed the juxtaposition of the 50th anniversary of the march from Selma to Montgomery with the repeated killings of unarmed black men and the demands for justice expressed in the Black Lives Matter movement. For Unitarian Universalists, the Selma anniversary became an occasion to re-examine our history and a pilgrimage to rededicate ourselves to our commitment to racial justice. On a personal note, I was not prepared for the palpable sense of connection to our history as I sat in Brown Chapel in Selma and crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge. Gordon's 50 years as a Unitarian Universalist minister began with jail time in Selma, one month before the violence erupted in 1965. Ordained that same year in January, Gordon was arrested in a February demonstration for voting rights. He was given a five-day sentence, though he spent a full week in jail, and this led to decades of a ministry that held racial justice at its core. His work over the years to lift up our involvement in the civil rights era through leading tours, helping to form the project, and authoring a recent Skinner House book, Southern Witness has kept our heritage alive and relevant. He has done his work in a manner that embodies humility. He leads by example. In your honor, the UUA will donate $1,000 to an organization of your choice, and not too surprisingly, the Living Legacy Project <laughs> is the recipient that was identified. <laughs> You have made this jewel of Unitarian Universalism even stronger with this gift. Gordon, we're all in your debt. You have helped our movement to know itself more deeply and to maintain its commitment. Our legacy is alive and well because of your tireless and loving work. On behalf of the entire association, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Peter, many thanks for this recognition and for your kind words about me. This was not one of those instances in which an honoree had to think, I wonder who he's talking about. <laughs> and yet, this award cannot be all about me. I am an incredibly fortunate person in the situations I have found myself in and the people, historic and contemporary, whose paths I have crossed. As a young minister, I stood each week in Theodore Parker's former pulpit. Later, I located the personal papers of 18th century Universalist and women's advocate, Judith Sargent Murray. I heard William Sloan Coffin, Jr., Martin Luther King, Sr. and Jr., and Malcolm X. Good mentors and friends have been a constant. Beyond my wonderfully supportive family and the congregations I've served, I especially need to lift up my teammates in the Living Legacy Project. This, this is a circle of people who saw value in an idea that my wife, Judy, and I began developing and implementing as I neared retirement. The Living Legacy Project has improved and extended what we had begun. 
and I've seen our civil rights pilgrimages and the recent Selma conference challenge, change, and empower people. There's something in the process of coming face to face with people, places, and stories of the civil rights movement that has changed more lives than all 50 years of my preaching. This is truly the work of Sankofa, of looking back in order to move forward with greater wisdom, of remembering the past in order to creatively shape the future to be more just. I've been privileged to live in interesting times with engaged and interesting people, including some in this room right now. I see you. Together, we have done this work. I'm Peter. Yes. Stay up here. <laughs> Peter and Jim. Speaking of interesting people, I've had a chance to be with. A week ago, I was privileged to have two members of the Reeb family in the congregation as I preached in San Francisco. They asked me to present to you two a picture from Selma inscribed to the Unitarian Universalist Association on behalf of the Reverend James Reeb family. We gratefully appreciate the memorial service March 6, mm. 2015. Marie Reeb and each of her children. Wow. So, wow. for the association. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> great. 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 Thank you. Okay. And there we go. I couldn't be more pleased with uh, Gordon receiving this recognition. I had the distinct honor and privilege of to travel with. Gordon and Judy and the Living Legacy team and experience that Sankofa moment that he spoke about. Liz and I made our pilgrimage in 2009. It was an event that informed my life in a way that led me to this place, standing before you as moderator. Now welcome Jessica York, Faith Development Director for the presentation of the Angus McLean Award. Give it up for Jessica. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. I'm Jessica York, your Faith Development Director at the Unitarian Universalist Association. Many of the resources that we create in the Faith Development Office help Unitarian Universalists examine and articulate their lived faith. There is one easy way that some people explain it to children. Say it along with me if you know it. We are Unitarian Universalists with minds that think, hearts that love, and hands that are ready to serve. That description sounds a lot to me like the work of Reverend Ginger Luke. Reverend Luke's gifts of the mind and the hands and especially of the heart are the reason why she is this year's Angus H. McLean Award recipient. The Angus H. McLean Award was established in 1972 by the St. Lawrence University Theological School Alumni Association and the Religious Education Department of the UUA. It's awarded each year to someone who has made outstanding contributions to religious education. 
McLean is one of our religious ancestors, best known perhaps for his address, The Method is the Message. Ginger, like McLean, is a minister and a teacher, but like McLean, is perhaps most treasured because of the heart that she brings to this work. There is no doubt that Reverend Luke is a person who applies her mind to the theological questions that our religion faces. It led her to obtain her Master's of Divinity degree in 2001 from Meadville Lombard Theological School, where she received the Roberta Nelson Award for Excellence in Religious Education. She was ordained the following year by the River Road Unitarian Church. Ginger wrote an essay for the groundbreaking book, Essex Conversations, Visions for Lifespan Religious Education, a work that has played a formative part in Unitarian Universalist religious education ever since it was published in 2001. She currently serves on the panel of theological education. And Ginger's hands seem to always be open and ready to give service to our faith. She served as the Director of Religious Education or the Minister of Religious Education for over 20 years to congregations in Lincoln, Nebraska, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Ann Arbor, Michigan, and River Road Congregation in Bethesda, Maryland, which she now serves as Minister Emerita since her retirement. She's a teaching and preaching elder receiving the Skinner Sermon Award in 2000. Other credits to her prolific service include serving on the board of the Liberal Religious Educators Association, or Lareda, and her current service on the Lareda Endowment Committee and the President's Council. In 2013, she was the recipient of the Meadville Lombard Theological School Alumni Service Award for her exemplary service to that school. But what most people will tell you is special about Ginger is her heart. Throughout her 22 years of serving as a Loretta Good Officer, she has offered support, guidance, and nurturance to a generation of religious educators. Her work within the River Road congregation was marked by a devotion to family ministry and the way that she brought people together to create beloved community. She exhibits a depth of not just understanding how our little religion can make a big difference in the world, but the sensitivity to see the places where extra care must be applied to help us be as one. With her thinking mind and her serving hands and her loving heart, Ginger Luke is a Unitarian Universalist <laughs> and the 2015 recipient of the Angus H. McLean Award for Excellence in Religious Education. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I am humbled by this award which should be shared by hundreds of children, youth, volunteers, staff, teachers, and peers who have helped and guided me in religious education. I encourage all of you in your various roles as Unitarian Universalists to ask every day, how is it with the children. Listen to the answer in your own mind and from the mouths of others, especially the children. How is it with our children, all of our children? Thank you and bless you all. photography moment.
Ginger, I'll add my congratulations, well deserved. Our next item of business today is to consider and vote on the proposed amendments to make the bylaws neutral regarding the governance structure of districts and regions. These are found on pages 102 and through 110 of the final agenda. The mini assembly concerning these amendments was held Friday. Will the vice moderator make the appropriate motion? I will, eventually. Um, before I make the motion, there, I think the ushers have some handouts that we would like to give to um, any delegate who needs this. This has the copy of the amendments that we have incorporated as well as the unincorporated. We apologize for not getting these handed out on your way into the hall. We had managed to confuse each other. If you have the app, these amendments are in the app. Um, you go to the section that has the agenda and you will see the amendments listed. And this is the one that looks like it says amendments to change and that would be the one that that you would you would go look for. So I'd ask if you if you need if you need a copy, be sure to get one. And if you don't need one, that will be that will be appreciated. Okay. So what what I'm going to do, and I think we the, I'm hoping the tech deck can bring the copy of the amendments up so that we can show them to everyone here in the hall. And I'm going to talk through these amendments so that we all know what they are. Okay. I'm going to give it, a, give it a minute so that people can get their copies. For those of you who were in the mini assembly, I think you'll see that we, we incorporated and incorporated. So I want, to, I want to start by thanking the people who came to the mini assembly and particularly Bill Sasso from the Central Midwest. Mid-America, oh my gosh, how could I do that? Mid-America, thank you. But anyway, definitely Bill, because he, he worked really hard to put together the most, these amendments that you're going to see, and many people worked on amendments. You'll see that it was a lot of thought that went into these. So the first set of amendments that we're going to incorporate that in, says unincorporated amendment one, these are a series of changes to the proposal that make an important change. The proposal had a variety of places where congregations could come together to work on petitions to put things on the agenda for the delegates, and it would require them to have um, signatures from, the original bylaws were from, no more from a certain region and then it had to be geographically diverse. And in the proposal we had added, just added the words or region wherever it said district. And the feeling was is that what that did was for those places who no longer had districts but had regions, is it made it much more difficult to get congregations to come together and you couldn't work with the ones near you. So these sets of changes are specifically designed to make it easier to collaborate with nearby congregations and to remove a barrier that had been put in, in the bylaws. So I think this was, a, this was a great improvement and the mini assembly was very excited about that. So that's what those changes in incorporated amendment one do. The next amendment that we incorporated um, is actually down in the, in the rules. Some of our rules are G rules that only the General Assembly can change. Um, the proposal had taken out what was a long list of the existing districts at a point of time. It was no longer current. Um, and I think that part of you know, what we don't want is every time a district changes their name for the delegates to always vote on what, you know, to, to have veto power over what a, a district has decided to do. Um, but it was unclear whether the board or the, the General Assembly had the ability to admit or to recognize new districts or changes in districts or for someone to leave. And this change makes it clear that that authority resigns with the General Assembly delegates. The third amendment that we incorporated, which is at lines 306 to 308, um, starts to deal with the, the, the issue of neutrality across the various districts and regions, the various congregations, regardless of whether they have a district or regional governance structure. Um, we have 
a number of congregations in the southern region where they no longer have district or regional governance structures. And the language that is going in here provides a mechanism for congregations who are located in an area without a district or regional governance structure to call together something that looks like a district or regional assembly and do some business. And so that just provides another way for those congregations to collaborate. The fourth amendment that we incorporated um, was something that started to deal with what was really a kind of a technical problem in between our bylaws and our rules, and it has to do with a conflict between the timing of when congregations who wanted to place something on the business agenda needed to have their petitions submitted and when the congregational poll that goes out to every congregation would happen. Um, the way the rules are today is, there, is that the poll goes out before those petitions are due, and the proposal had been to move the date for the petitions to be due to be early enough for the congregational poll, and we've undone that proposed change with this amendment, and the idea is to make it easier rather than more difficult for congregations to put something on the agenda. And then you'll see that there is an unincorporated amendment one that goes on for several pages. And this is a whole series of changes that were really presented in the mini assembly as an alternative. There were really two alternatives presented to um, enable districts and regions to continue to have the abilities that they do today within the bylaws. So there were two proposals offered. The one that we inc the incorporated did accomplished one of the goals that the, the board had articulated as we proposed these, which was to put congregations in a neutral position regardless of the decisions they had made, their, their areas had made about district or regional governance. So the proposal that was incorporated um, in, the, in the board's judgment did a better job of assuring that neutrality. So those were all of the, the changes. I think before we move on, I, I would like to offer anyone who has questions about the amendments, just so that we, can under, we all know what we're going to be voting on. If you have questions, now would be a good time to, um, for the offsite or for someone to come to, if you have a question. And I'd suggest questions for understanding at the procedure microphone. Do you want me to move it first? No, why don't you move it? Okay, we'll I'll, mo I'll move it and then we're in a good position to discuss. So, moved that the proposed amendments to make the bylaws neutral regarding the governance stu structure of districts and regions found on pages 102 through 110 of the final agenda as adopted by the mini assembly be, as amended by the mini assembly be adopted by this assembly. Is there a second on that? Yes, easily. Uh, so I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Kurt DeWeiss from the Abraham Lincoln Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Springfield, Illinois. Um, I, I just have really a, a question, a clarification. Having worked fairly extensively on the more detailed version of the amendments that were considered in the mini assembly, and, and I have to say that I'm a former legislative aide where page and line references and all of that kind of thing are very essential for people to know where the changes were. Uh, so I found it kind of tedious, but did that was the essence of my amendment. Um, I guess what I'm looking for are assurances that the relationships that our region, the Mid-America region, for example, uh, are preserved in relationship to the UUA, to the board. I, I think the incorporated amendments accomplished that, but because I just now received this language, it's difficult to know how they interface because the amendments that were incorporated uh, are not the kind of amendment that I would probably have drafted if I had sat down with uh, my counterpart to actually fashion a comprehensive amendment. Thank you, and I think I can assure, not I think, we can assure you that uh, we believe we've accomplished that so that 
anybody that still identifies as a district or region or in a place where there are no, uh, has equal standing in the association and a relationship with the board, absolutely. We spent a lot of time on that uh, last night. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate the fact that you did respond to what was uh, discussed in the mini assembly where I think there was general support for what I was trying to accomplish and what I think uh, Bill Sasso also attempted to accomplish, especially the recognition of the uh, areas of the country that are not organized as we are. Yeah, I think it was a good example of the mini assembly. I sat through a little bit of it. Um, it was a good example of how these mini assemblies really can shape uh, what the board brings to you for consideration. So I thank you for that. Thank you. I have another. Uh, I recognize the delegate at the procedures microphone. Mr. Moderator, my name is Jim Cravar Graham. I'm a delegate from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. As you may remember, I rose to this microphone several times yesterday during the debate around the board motion to amend our bylaws and move the committee on appraisal to a board committee. My concern at the time was that many members of marginalized communities within our association, including people of color and youth, were aligned and ready to speak on the topic on both the pro and con sides of the issue. Instead of doing uh, what all we could to invite and include and listen to their voices in our debate, we instead chose to spend time, in my, in my estimation, far too much time debating procedure and amendments to the main motion. Given that we have limited time as a body and that this body only meets one week per year, it seems to me that we might do all we can to ensure that those most affected by the white heteronormative cisgender and other privileges that affect how we interact with each other as well as how our systems of governance interact with them, are heard. To that end, I would like to move that for the remainder of this General Assembly, we amend our rules of procedure such that time spent at the procedural microphone are not deducted from the motion clock. While I know that that may push the time of our debate and the meeting a little longer, I would hope that this body would allow more time for debate on the main questions before us, and that particularly when we approach the debate ourselves as people of privilege, we step back, if at all possible, to encourage those delegates identities to have their say and share their perspectives first so that they are given the weight they so deserve. Thank you. And of course, are, are you willing to make that into a motion to suspend the rules? I am, I am making a motion to suspend the rules, to, to uh, amend the rules of procedure such that time spent at the procedural clock does not affect the motion clock as a whole. Okay. Is there a second for that? Sounds like we're good. It'll take two thirds vote of the hall and the offsite to. Uh, to do, we have do we have do anybody? Does anybody want to speak to whether they want to speak for or against it? Or are you ready to vote? All those in favor of changing the rules? Thank you. Those opposed? Clearly, we have suspended the rules or changed the rules to allow that to be taken off the clock. I'm good with that. Make sure that the tech deck's ready to do that. And so I would uh, give a heads up to the uh, tech deck to make sure as we go through, through the day, we, we don't start the, don't keep the clock running while we have people at the procedures microphone. And they already set us back to 30 minutes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Recognize that. First Universalist Church, Rockland, Maine. I would just ask once again that you be really clear on which unincorporated amendment we are talking about, what page it's on in the book, and what line it's on, so we see the context. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'll take it. Right, and, and the unincorporated amendment actually covers a whole variety of pages and lines which are listed in detail in the one unincorporated amendment we have. We included all of those as a piece because it didn't make sense to do them bit by bit. I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Bruce Wiggins, First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee. Question of understanding. What does neutrality mean in this context? I'm just not clear operationally what it really means. It, it, so that the ability for congregations to bring things to the preliminary agenda or the final agenda are equal whether you're in a district or region without governance that has annual assemblies or whether you're in a re district or region that has governance. So it just treats everybody the same. That's the neutrality piece. Thank you. Thank you. So are we ready to hear the board's position? I recognize the trustee of the pro microphone. So I think Donna has done a fantastic job <laughs> representing what the board position is. I'm gonna read it out. 
Just real quick so you all have it. Yeah, we need it for the record. That's right. In 2010, the UUA board initiated a conversation with the district presidents and the district boards regarding the role of districts in our associational governance. With the move to policy governance, it was clear that having district boards involved in overseeing the UUA staff was not ideal. The various districts and regions have taken a wide variety of approaches to answering the call from the UUA board to reimagine and clarify oversight of our UUA field staff. The Southern Region has answered that call in a very complete way, and this spring, the four districts in the Southern Region each voted to eliminate their district governance structures and move to an advisory and collaborative process with the regional staff. We will not have district or regional boards or governance structures. The proposed amendments put the bylaws in a position of neutrality regardless of the decisions that individual districts or regions make regarding their path towards regionalization. In particular, there will be no significant penalty for moving forward to completely eliminate governance structures that overlap with the UA board. The UA Board of Trustees asks for your support and approval of this bylaw revision. Thank you. Let me explain the process here. We have up to 30 minutes exclusive of the procedural mic time now um, for debate on this bylaw. We have 20 minutes before we can consider any unincorporated amendments. Um, and we can't uh, call the question until we've had at least 12 minutes, 10 minutes, excuse me, 10 minutes. I'm getting some advice and counsel again. Jim, actually, we have 23 minutes left. And if there's nobody at the pro or con right. mic, we can go straight to amendments. Understood. So we can go straight to the amendments once we have cleared the line, if it's earlier than those 10 minutes that I suggested. I recognize the delegate at the con mic. Is the delegate ready? Uh, yes, uh, Jesse Ford, delegate from Church of the Larger Fellowship. Uh, while I'm generally supportive of most of this uh, language, I um, am wondering why it's necessary to specify the type of governance structure that must be adopted, uh, the, the, the criteria for establishing governance should a region choose to do that, would it not make more sense to let that region uh, create their own uh, method for uh, having representation? And if, I if I've missed something, I and, apologize. And that is what this bylaw allows, districts and Regions can well remove it. Does are say, you spe you're speaking against it? Yes. Well, I'm s I'm speaking against the part that says, in a district or region that does not maintain a formal governance structure, a meeting for this purpose may be convened by, and then it goes on to list a bunch of specifics. There have to be 15 congregations. There have to be. Well, that's consistent with the current bylaws. So I think you've expressed your opinion. You've got some more time, but. Uh, I think you're asking a procedural question in terms of how this is going to be implemented. But uh, the, yeah, uh, that could be. That could be. <laughs> but uh, uh, so that, that's I, the question. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's it's just a statement time. It's not an interactive time with the moderator. Uh, I'll go to the uh, delegate at the pro microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Bill Sasso, delegate from the Carbondale Unitarian Fellowship in Southern Illinois, and for two more days, president of the Mid-America Region. <laughs> I expected to be at the con microphone. I'm pleased to be at the pro microphone. The Mid-America Region Board passed a resolution opposing the original version of this set of bylaws amendments. It's a very complex eight pages worth of bylaws amendments. But I'm pleased that, in my mind at least, and I hope in yours as well, the revised version which is presented now for our adoption represents an affirmation of grassroots democracy, an affirmation of collective work, collective discernment by representatives of our congregations, and maintains current opportunities for us to bring things to the attention of the General Assembly when it's necessary to do that. The Mid-America Board took the position against this for reasons that I think now support it, that we affirm the role of districts and regions in UUA governance, that we believe that regions and districts which maintain governance structures should 
maintain the, the capacities that their earlier districts had, and that we think there should be at least an opportunity for a dis district or region which chooses not to maintain governance structures to, if necessary, hold a governance event. No one's making it do that, but it's an opportunity, it's a potential that's there if it should be needed. Finally, we believe that this is a time of experimentation in governance and regionalization across our Unitarian Universalist Association. During this time, the rights of districts and regions to exercise mid-level governance and other forms of mid-level leadership should not be removed, they should be encouraged. I encourage you to support this. I thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. I have a delegate at the procedure mic. Deanne Peterson, UU Congregation of Atlanta, also for the next two days, Mid-South District President, the last of those representing the <laughs> Southern Region. I have a point of clarification for the board on the incorporated amendment for lines 611 through 614, paragraph number two on the handout that I have. It says, following the current text, add the following two sentences. I'm not sure if that occurs. I'm looking at the booklet now. Does that occur as a line item E, or is it added to subset D? Let me turn to the facilitator of that mini assembly. Um, actually, you know, I better look. That'd be a good idea, I think. And we're not running the clock. Are we good? Are we good? The way this is drafted, it's going to be going at the end of D, as in dog, okay? Because what they haven't done is added an E before these two sentences. I'm not saying it couldn't have been done differently, I'm just saying that's the way it's been done. That adds a level of... Confusion for you? Is it obvious on my face? Because <laughs> <laughs> it adds a level of um, governance to what used to be just a congregational level request. So it changes the intent, I believe. Well, the intent is clearly to allow the, the, what's been there for years, the 15 congregations to, or whatever the number is, to come together and bring something to the agenda. Is that your question? I'm not sure I'm following it. Are you, are you with me, Donna? Can you help me with this? Or Tom? Because we're relaxed now. We're not eating up all that time. This is good. I like it. Excellent. So I'm sorry. Help me understand. The item D says that 15 certified member congregations by action of their governing boards, which would be at the congregational level as I understand it, yes. can get together to bring something as a proposed amendment. Now we have an addition to that that says that it must be done at a district or a region level, not at the congregational level. So that's still there and then we get this Rather than the deleting We don't want to take that So we don't take E out. <laughs> Where does it say that? Right there, okay, rather than deleting the text. Okay. So we don't take All right, that out. Let, me, let me clarify. I'm sorry, I was focusing on the second paragraph and I think I misspoke a minute ago, so I apologize. Right after where it says lines 611 to 614, it says rather than deleting the text as proposed, maintain the current adding or region following each occurrence of the word district. So E stays in. All right, so okay. I misspoke earlier because I was focusing on paragraph two. And then these two sentences in what's listed as numbered paragraph two on your yellow sheets would be inserted at the end of E. Of I can live with that and so can the Southern Region. I, Thank apologize. You. I apologize. We'll get Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate the help. We have a delegate at the procedure mic. My name is Diana DeWeese. I'm with the Abraham Lincoln Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Springfield, Illinois. In looking at the detailed um, amendment that was not incorporated, you just, okay, you just assured me that the relationship between regions and districts in the UUA would stay the same. Mm -hmm. But I'm looking 
and there was a proposed change under UUA Statement of Conscience, lines starting with line 334, where district was, was uh, removed. And so it would just be member congregations and sponsoring organizations. So that changes the relationship. And I'm wondering, is that a mistake on your part to not uh, change that to say districts or regions? And then, now, and now it says not districts, not that, regions. That's not our. That's not our intent, and I think we have it covered so elsewhere. Why don't we do this? Why don't you and I meet over here? Because it, rather than taking everyone's time, and let's go over it together. There are several places. Can, okay, so let's do. Let's take some time together over here while the debate can continue. Well, we have no one at the con mic, so we could go to the amendment, uh, the unincorporated amendment, if we so choose. Is there anybody want to consider the unincorporated amendment? That's what she and Tom are working on. Okay, we're working on that, I guess we're saying. I thought that was just a word change. Tech Deck, can you pull up the unincorporated amendment? I don't think they're ready, they're not ready. We're waiting, but we can still read what's up there while we, uh, while we see where we're going. We don't have a musician, we could sing. I, rec I recognize the delegate at the procedure mic. This is Kurt DeWeese again from Springfield, Illinois. Um, just pending the discussion about complying with the intent of the uh, incorporated amendments, um, I, I think having drafted the unincorporated amendment, I'm not intending to pursue it if in fact the ah. intent is to essentially maintain the relationship of the regions and districts to the board and in the regular processes. Thank you, and that, I can, I'll confirm again. That is our intent. We have uh, an off-site delegate uh, at the procedure um, queue. Would the tech tech uh, bring that uh, delegate in? Hi. This is, uh, we hear Miller. you. We hear you, Sally. Jersey. I just um, back to the six eleven to six fourteen. Um, my understanding is that in the proposed changes document, it says that it would be put formatted correctly so that it would work. I'm suspecting as an independent statement or the goal, I'm sure, and I would just want to clarify this, is that congregations who do not have a governance body, districts and regions are all, uh, the third clarification, are all treated similarly and therefore it would be patched on to a reference to a governance body that is of a congregation. Check. Did you follow me? So um, I'm actually a little puzzled. The, the only place I know of where that was is, is a document that I didn't think we were sending to the offsite delegates. So you should be looking at something that is just, it's not a reprint of the whole motion. It's just a list of the individual changes that we're going to make to it. That is correct. That is what I'm looking at, and where, I believe. Where is that? It is on a PDF on, the, on our delegate blog. No, 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 no. Where, where in the document that you're reading is where the, the part? Well, I, I, well, I'm reading it on, on the line 611, number one, rather than deleting the text as proposed, maintain the current. Number two, following the current text, say the following sentences. Um, Page two? Uh, maybe. Uh, let me see. Can I? Where is she? Yes. Ah, page two of four. <laughs> page. Page two. Of this. Right. Um, so ask your question again. Okay. So my question, uh, an earlier question was the concern that item number two here underlined six eleven to six fourteen. Right. would be patched onto a reference to a congregational governance body. And I'm just clarifying that that was not, in fact, She's asking the same question. going to mm -hmm. happen to confuse matters further. Okay. Right. So, so what we clarified when she asked that question is that if you go to the um, original proposal, there was some text that was going to be deleted that I believe was item right. E. That text is not going to be deleted under this 
proposed this amendment that was incorporated. So that is undeleted. And then so at the e. right, so part E stays yeah. there. Okay. And and then in addition, cool. these sentences are added to the to the end of appended to the end of part E. So they are part of Got it. part E. Thank you. Sorry. This is the stump the chump line. Thank you. <laughs> um, we don't have anybody at the con mic. Is the body ready to vote on the the main motion? No. Oh, we have an amendment. We're still working on. Why don't we go to the pro mic and just listen to you while we... Uh, I recognize the delegate at the pro, mi pro microphone. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm Reverend Cynthia Landrum, minister and delegate from the Universalist Unitarian Church of East Liberty in Clark Lake, Michigan. And I'm up here at the pro microphone just because I told so many people this week that I would be at the con microphone <laughs> that I wanted to, them to see me over here because I want to thank the board and the very good work of my colleague on the Mid-America board, Bill Sasso, for the work on this amendment. I think it does really create the neutrality that we've been looking for in Mid-America and in the southern region so that both districts and regions and districts without governance and regions without governance are all neutral in their ability to bring forward motions to this General Assembly and it provides that, sim that same level of mid-level stuff that we've been be enjoying before being able to do, we can still do it. I know that they uh, stopped meeting over there, so I'm gonna conclude and we're gonna find out what happened. Thank you very much. Drum roll. Um, Tom? Well, again, while we're, while we're waiting, let's go to the con microphone. I recognize the delegate at the con microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. My name is Bob Hood. I'm a delegate from the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Chico, California. I came to this GA prepared to vote um, against this set of bylaw amendments. And, you know, I've got to tell you, it, it's pretty confusing for me. I'm a simple guy. But a few years back, we, we, we started this whole uh, regional structure as a result of the experience of our sister congregations in the South and, and sister districts as well. Um, so I didn't worry about it too much. Didn't think it was a good idea, but I thought, oh, things will, eventually they'll swing back in the other direction and you know, regions will be passe and districts will come back. It seemed to me that uh, this set of bylaws, uh, I got to check the time here. You're good. Oh, I'm doing good. good. You got a minute nine. It seemed to me that this uh, set of bylaw amendments um, were, were undermining what happens in the district. You know, we're, I'm, I'm in California. The uh, Western District is huge, and it makes it uh, difficult to do business. Um, I have participated in, in a regional assembly and in a, a regional leadership. Uh, uh, experience, which was very good, but it was awfully difficult and challenging to travel that far to do it. So it just didn't feel right to me at all. And so this morning I'm listening with the work of yesterday's um, workshop and I, my confusion, and I'm prepared to stay with my uh, uh, vote against this set of bylaws. I think it, it doesn't serve um, our collective interest in the long run, and, and I, I kind of think if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs> um, I, I don't mean to be rude, but you know, that, there's that phrase about putting lipstick on a pig. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, I would I would try to reassure the delegates that it is not our intent to have districts or regions do anything specific. We, we're inviting all entities to look at governance and do what they think is appropriate within polity for their congregation. So this doesn't inhibit uh, district staying or region staying. So I'll go to the amendment microphone and recognize the delegate. Bill Sasso from Carbondale, Illinois. As, in, as a perfecting amendment to the incorporated amendments, I'd like to move the very last bullet point on page four, which should have been included in the materials submitted to the mini assembly as part of 
amend, earlier amendments, but um, frankly, I missed it. And I want to thank the DeWeese family of Springfield, Illinois, for their attention to detail and calling that to our collective attention. Could you um, recite you for is. us? Again, could sure. we get tech deck? Could we get that up on the okay. screen? So Do we have it? On page 110 of the of the book, it's the very last, very last bullet point on page four of the yellow handout is what I'm moving. So it's a part of the large unincorporated amendment. And on page 110, which deals with, which includes rule G15.2.1, line 662, the intention of this amendment is to retain the existing language and insert after the word district the words, or a region. So you're, that's on the yellow sheet. Okay, so you're so proposing. That's the, yeah, that's on the yellow sheet. Ah, the unincorporated piece. And no. this, this text in the booklet refers to the form in which a proposed UUA bylaws amendment originating with a congregation or a district or a region, if this is accepted, uh, the form in which that's sent in to, the, to our association. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you. Before we debate it, I recognize the delegate at the procedure microphone. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Jim Kravar Graham from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. I have a clarifying question sure. around this particular amendment. I would like to understand, is the delegate suggesting that we adopt just this last bullet? It's or, a perfect. It's, yeah. Or, or, <laughs> Is he suggesting that it is perfecting the language of this bullet, which was not correctly captured during the mini-assembly, um, and we are moving the entire unincorporated amendment one? No. Help me. I recognize the uh, delegate at the amendment microphone. The first one you said, where only the final bullet is being moved as an amendment for the consideration of this body, My concern is I believe that that would be out of order because that would be a new amendment which was then not considered separately at the mini-assembly. <laughs> I take your point, uh, but I'm, I'm inclined to permit the uh, perfection if, if the delegate body is okay with that. I'm, I'm fine with perfecting language of an amendment as it was presented to the mini-assembly if it's just about correcting language. But we're now moving an entirely separate unincorporated amendment which was not addressed at the mini-assembly and that is where that business gets done. I agree with that. It, it was addressed at the mini-assembly in the context of the overall unincorporated amendment. What the delegate has said was that he made, uh, he, he had intended to include that, made a mistake, it was picked up. So this is a perfecting amendment. It's not a substantive change. And if I heard Mr. Sasso correctly, this change is consistent with the others that he has proposed, and it would be, it would create an inconsistency if it were not included. Okay. So we're just trying to be consistent. I hope everyone appreciates that. Thank you. So, we can vote if we're ready. Sorry? Ah, you're right. I always forget the amendment we're talking about. We've got a second on the amendment. Does anybody want to debate the amendment? Seeing none, are you ready to vote on the amendment? That's a yes. So, all those in favor of this amendment, please indicate by raising your yellow card. Thank you. Those opposed? It clearly passes, and I see that we have the off-site votes there. Thank you very much. Good process. Are we ready to discuss the main menu or vote on the main uh, motion? Menu's on my mind. It's lunchtime, you know. <laughs> We're ready? Would you like to speak to the main motion? <laughs> I recognize the delegate at the pro microphone. Um, hi, I'm Emma Cullen from the Shelter Rock New York congregation and the Metro New York district. As we move towards the change to regionalization, 
It's important to realize that districts and regions are not just a governance structure, but the basis of the youth community. District youth programming is one of the main reasons that many youth are so involved in Unitarian Universalism, myself included. The youth community created by this programming provides support, friendship, empowerment, and affirmation that we are not alone in our faith. District identity and culture is firmly embedded in the youth community and has been for years. We support this movement, but if districts are to eventually be dissolved, then it is important that they remain intact until a well thought out plan is in place to ensure the youth community is not detrimentally impacted by this change. <laughs> with the changes to these bylaws proposed, the youth communities within these districts are preserved as we move forward. Youth are the future of this faith, and how this change impacts their future needs to be considered before district governances are dissolved. Thank you. Thank you. There being no delegates at the con microphone, we can move to vote on the main motion. Are we ready? There's a second. Those in favor, please raise your yellow cards. Oh, I know how this is going to turn out. Thank you. Those opposed. The motion clearly passes. Thank you. Was that better than yesterday? You know, we're at the end of our business this morning, so I want to call on uh, our secretary, Susan Ritchie, for any announcements we may have. And she's got a piece of paper in her hands, so I suspect she does. I have a reminder here to ask folks to please check the lost and found in room C120. I believe, but do not know, that this announcement is directed to people who have lost items. I am also delighted to be able to give you a total for the collection that we made for the GA Scholarship Fund. That offering came in just short of $18,000. Wow. Well, thank you for your generosity. Just short of 18. Lovely, lovely. Thank you, Susan. Pleased with that. There being no further business to come before us in accordance with the schedule set forth in your program book, I declare that this general session of the General Assembly shall stand in recess until 1.30 this afternoon. Enjoy lunch.